the Lord placed on my heart as we began. He said, Zen, you can't talk about an altar before you talk about the Ark of Covenant. Because you can't talk about altars without the Ark of Covenant, and you can't talk about altars and the Ark of Covenant without the priests and the priesthood. They three are going to have a commonality that you're going to have to understand. So before we can understand what altars are, I'm going to address the Ark of Covenant. I'm going to then address the matter of an altar, and I'm going to address the matter of a priesthood. Because what I want you to look at the dimension of the fact that it's a three, the totality of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Right. When the Lord began to deal with me, the Ark of Covenant, he says, in the Ark of Covenant is the spirit. The altars are your soul. Your priesthood is your body. Because now the old priesthoods had to dwell and deal with sacrifices into the temple, into the building, into the makeup. But now we are the temple. We are the body. We are the makeup that God dwells in. So we are going to be the sacrifice that needs to be made in exchange. So we about to get into this to help you understand it. So the Ark of Covenant is going to represent the dimension of our spirit because everything is governed first by the spiritual realm and then the rest of it will trickle down it's spirit first then of course your soul is housed within your body and your spirit as well so let's look at it thank you prophet Obin. so a ark is compared to a sanctuary a place of shelter, refuge, a haven, a hiding place, or a port in a storm. See, an ark is where you can seek protection and covering. When seeing all these synonymous terms describing what an ark is, it's like immediately your mind should begin to think of Noah building the ark, right? David crying out to God in Psalms 91 for covering and protection and dancing with the ark we saw throughout the scripture. And then, of course, we saw Moses who established a tabernacle that mentions of the ark that was inside the holiness of holiness. So what we think of, the ark is basically the presence of the Lord. So let's look at Exodus 25, 8 to 9. We're going to get into the scripture. And this is where it begins to talk about where the Lord begins to ask Moses to make a tabernacle. And he begins to explain what the ark is and, and just listen clear, clear, clearly. Exodus 25, 8 through 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. You heard that. The only way we can worship God is spirit and in truth, right? God is a spirit, so I need to dwell with another spirit, meaning your human spirit. But I need you to first make me a sanctuary, meaning a physical space, a building or a thing that I may dwell among you or among them, which is people. According to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and a pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Now let's go down a little bit further to Exodus 25 to 21. It says, and you shall put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. And there I will meet with you and I will commune with you from above the mercy seat from between two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things, which I will give you in the commandment unto the children of Israel. Every time you hear the word witness and testimony, you need to think of Jesus. Just keep this in your mind. And we overcame the enemy, right? With the blood of the lamb and his testimony. Remember, God is, Jesus is constantly giving giving testimony of what he did in the earth when we become one with him. So just keep these things in mind as we are rolling out. So what is the ark? The ark symbolized the presence of the Lord. And this is the way you're going to look at an ark in three different ways of that presence. It was a, rest, a repository for the sun tablets, the stone tablets given to Moses, which were what? A witness. So you already got a witness within the tabernacle. Then he said, it's going to be a testimony to the requirements for the Israelites have to agree with. So what I'm telling you in this tabernacle, there is laws in this covenant, which is the ark. There is conditions for you to enter in. There is conditions for you to keep. There is conditions that your spirit man must be able to accelerate and ascend to in order to do what I need you to do. And then on the second one, it says on the annual day of atonement, 
The high priest would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, the ark's cover in keeping with the Lord's provision for dealing with sins of the people. So you got to understand if you're going to be in the presence of the Lord, you know, he's holy. So you can't be up in there with all that sin. So God got to begin to cleanse you and deal with you. Now we know that our regenerated spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, don't carry sin. But you got to understand you being a human spirit still have issues where you got to make certain it's in alignment and it's in order with God. That's what you're going to do. When it's saying the day of atonement, you're really saying I'm entering the Ark of Covenant because I'm about to align my spirit man with God. And after I align my spirit man with God, I can hear what he says to my soul. And then after it get into my soul, it can become something that I walk out in my body. I walk out in my flesh. So let's look at the third one. It says the Ark also was where the Lord met with Moses and he spoke with him in keeping with his earlier assurance of his presence with Moses. Notice there's an a, a emphasis on presence, on presence. Keep a track of this because remember, Jesus is the one that carries the presence through the spirit of God when he was in the earth. So keep a track of that. Look what it says, what the ark is defined as. The ark was a chest, right? It was a religious box that was carried and revered by the Israelites containing their law and other sacred items. It symbolizes Yahweh's salvation, his covenant, and his redemption. Y'all, don't that sound like, like Jesus? Okay. They said it's eternal counterpart form which the earthly replica was made when we look at Revelation eleven nineteen. Now, mind you, the ark has always been in the Old Testament, but you don't begin to see the ark in the New Testament again until you talk about what was actually happening in Apostle John's vision. And he began to look up in Revelation 11 and 19, and he began to speak about what was open in heaven. Let's go there. And the temple of God was open in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament did that word ark of his testament is that not the testimony of jesus and there was lightning and voices and thundering and earthquake and great hell is that not the father what are you are seeing is Jesus and the Father being one in the temple of God. You are seeing the entryway to the throne room. That's why when you even look at the throne room, if you ever approached it with Jesus and the Father, there's a covenant over them. There's some like when I remember transcending up there and when God translated me, I remember it's kind of like think about this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now this makes sense. When you get married and you get wed, what you do? They got that ark. It stands for covering. It stands for presence. It stands for that I am stamping God on this marriage. Now, we know everybody marriage ain't stamped by God, but I ain't here to clown like that. But I'm being real. Everything that is under that ark is saying I am governed by it. And when the, when the priest, when the minister or the person that's ordaining you to get married and celebrate you, they read from scriptures. They read from the laws that is governing that covering, which says this is what's going to protect you. This is what's going to keep you. But when you look later on, when we get into altars and you get into the priesthood, you begin to notice God's presence can't remain where altars are altered. God's presence can't remain if your altar is altered by Satan. Hear that again. God's presence can't remain if your altar is altered by Satan. You hence remove your covering, which is the presence of God. Then after that, your priesthood will begin to speak to another deity. Your priesthood will begin to speak to false gods. And that's when you're going to begin to have conflicts in your marriage. So begin to think about why you really beefing in your marriage. Which are some of you that are not actually operating as priests of God in your marriage? Are you not operating in where your ark and your covenant is in God? Are you operating where your altar is being altered by things in your soul that is undealt with? So let's go further. It says this ark 
has been in the Holy of Holiness, y'all, in the tabernacle, which was referred in Chronicles 36, 19, where the Babylonian army destroyed it. And we know that was the time, basically, where Solomon was going into ruins and everything else and stuff had to be rebuilt up and all of those different things. This is what it looks like when you allow the presence of God to be overtaken by things that are on your altar, and to be overtaken by things that you do as a priest to God or a priest to another deity. So when the Lord instructed Moses, I want to take you to another verse, y'all, because I'm reading a lot of scripture because I got to lay the foundation to really get into helping you understand why the Ark of Covenant is dealing with your spiritual realm and your spiritual capacity to receive what God wants to do. And then it's dealing with your altar, which is the actual fragments, because what does Satan want? He won't access to your soul. He wants access to your soul. And if he get access to your soul, he then get access to your body. And then he allows it to be overcome with other spirits. And it now becomes one where it's no longer an ark of the covenant, but is an ark of satanic stuff and rituals. So let's go to Exodus 40 and 1. And the Lord spoken to Moses saying, on the first day of the first month, you should set up a tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And you should put therein the Ark of Testimony. There you go. And the cover the Ark with the veil. How many times they said he tore the veil and he went behind it? And now we can go behind it because of Jesus. It was a veil that had to be covered in order to house the presence of his holiness. And you should bring in a table and set it in order, the things that are to be set in order upon it. And you should bring in the candlestick and light the lamps thereof. And you should set the altar of gopher incense before the ark of testimony and put the hanging of the door to tabernacle. You cannot get to the altar unless you first get into the ark. So that's what I'm trying to lay the groundwork. You have to first get into the Ark of the Covenant with your spiritual capacity, with the presence of God to evoke that intimacy because God is like, I'm a spirit to spirit. When you get married to your husband, it's spirits. Your spirit are merging to be under one union, under one unity of the Godhead. Then it's going to work out where you begin to tear up altars within your life. And then after you begin to tear up altars within your life, you then begin to be able to stand consistently as a priest unto God for your household, whether you're a woman or a man. So he says, the, uh, the Lord began to speak to me, said, Zen, the first time you see Ark mentioned in the Bible is actually Genesis 6 and 14. So look what it says, y'all. It reads, make yourself an Ark of gopher and wood. Make rooms in the Ark and cover, cover it inside and out with pitch. Why am I talking about Ark, y'all? Why is it imperative? Because Ark represented the first covenant that began with mankind on the earth. See, we always speak of Abraham and God's covenant through circumcision. However, the first covenant with mankind in the earth was with Noah. And you're going to read it. When, you're going to hear it when I go further down to show you how God and Noah established the first covenant on earth. Now, we know the first, first actual covenant was Adam and Eve. But I'm talking about after the destruction, after the newness, after, the new, after flooding it and judging it. It is the one that God said, this is the one that I am going to keep on having people to remember but I do want them to understand I want them to return back to the first one which is Adam and Eve but he said it was an ark when the Lord began to show me and take me into a vision he said Adam and Eve destroyed my present they destroyed my ark they destroyed the things that I had in place for them so then I had to put them outside of the ark because they got altered with another altar do you hear me they got altered by another altar, which was the words that were spoken by Satan. And after they got altered by another altar, they then became where their body was now a sacrifice as priest unto Satan and no longer unto the Lord, which is why God had to begin the journey of rebuilding a new ark and rebuilding them Noah to walk upright as a new altar and a foundation and then begin to establish throughout time priests. So I hope y'all keeping up with me. So Genesis 6 and 8 said, 
but Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation and Noah walked with God. I want y'all to get this because you got to understand that into the ark of God, you have to walk with God. See, this was the first time you see the word grace also showed up in the Bible, which illustrates God had a plan to show mankind undeserved favor or unmerited favor. Grace refers to the goodness of God extended to unders undeserving men. Some of you can't enter the ark of the covenant with God because you don't believe he good. You don't believe in his character. You don't believe in his righteousness. You don't believe God is who he said he is, which is also preventing you from getting into the presence of God. Then it prevents you to allow God to change the altar that you're dealing with and allow it to be eradicated. And then you become a priest standing in for before the Lord. He said, Zen, look at this. He said, we also see Noah walk with God. Just like Enoch who was translated up and he did not see death as well as Adam walking with God in the cool of the day in heaven in Genesis 3 and 7. Y'all, it's imperative that God's pursuit and present require us to walk with God. Y'all, God does not walk with us. We walk with God. That means that we are following after Christ. We are following after him. He does not go after us. He does not run to catch up to us. We are catching up with God. Because see, when you hear the term Noah, or when you hear the term walk with God, it means two different meanings. The first walk with God is when you're striding and you're trying to catch up to him. You're trying to be able to basically say, I want to know your secrets. Because in the ark is where you get the presence. In the ark is where Moses got the blueprint. In the ark is where he began to get the download of how to deal with the people. In the presence, in the covering of what he was working with, he was able to get the people. So you got to learn that Moses them walk with God. We don't allow God to walk with us. I'll prove it to you. James 4 and 8 says, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. You have to first make the step to say, God, let me repent and let me come into your presence. So let's be real. He said, this demonstrate we must pursue God and then he will pursue us back. See, trust God always really chose us first. Y'all, we didn't choose him. What this simply means, God always created the plan for us to seek him out and those that sought him would find him. What he said, if you seek for me with all your heart, with all your heart, you'll find me. But some of our hearts are fragmented. Some of our hearts are in carnal things. Some of our hearts are in the world. Some of our hearts are in our flesh. Some of our hearts are in our decisions. Let's be real. The reason we can't seek God with all our heart because there's an idol on your altar. God is not an idol. He's a deity. God is not to be idolized. God is to be worshiped. Let's get that clear. If you already got a perverted view that you going to see God like these other little false God and goblins and gooses and geese, you already got a perverted view of what God is because God is not to be idolized. God is to be worshiped. Worship means a sacrifice. When Abraham went to Mount Moriah, it was there where the Lord would provide. Jehovah Jireh met him and gave him a ram instead of having his son be sacrificed himself. You got to understand that. What is on the idols of your heart? You can't enter into the presence of God because you're also carrying another fragrance and another presence. We're doing the same thing when they had the alt when they had Adam and Cain, I mean Abel and Cain go through the same thing. Abel had a fragrance that was great in servants and amazing to God. Baby, Cain gave him just that scrap of that grass. He gave him nature worship. You want to know where new age comes from? You want to co know where yogi comes from and yoga and all of that? Congratulations. Th let's thank Cain. Because Cain, the one that started all of that, when he offered up that foolishness to God, when he offered up them plants to God, 
How are you going to offer up his creation instead of offer up something fat, something that could be burned? God said, I need a living sacrifice. He Listen, yes, plants live. There is life in a plant, but not according to the blood. There is blood in the animal. There was blood on the cross. There was blood. God said, I'm looking for something that's going to shed blood because it's the blood that activates the altar. It's the blood that allows you to even to come into the presence of the ark. Only reason Jesus, who is the ark, is because his blood is still dripping in the earth. It still speaks better than Abel. He said it. Look what it says, y'all. In Genesis 6, 17 through 18, we read, I'm going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark and you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. Let me read it again because I'm about to jump from Genesis 6 to Genesis 8 because I'm trying to prove to you the ark came before the altar because the altar went into the ark. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Now let's jump to Genesis 8 and 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. And he took up every clean beast and of every clean fowl. See, that's blood sacrifices, baby. And offered burnt offerings on the altar. Notice that first they have to come into the presence of God. Notice that the animals that God chose had to come into his presence. A lot of ministers minister, but they ain't got no presence of the Lord. A lot of people you listening to talking about they sharing the gospel, but they really preaching and living another Jesus. And then they spewing that foolishness in the pulpit because they have no presence and they have no power because they gave no sacrifice. They did not put themselves to be positioned in the place and the presence of God with their spirit because their spirit, man, is so focused on everything in the world except the word of God. And he said, and the, the, the Lord smelled a sweet savior. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore everything living as I've done. Now look at God. God said, I won't smite anything anymore living as I have done. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So why do you think God said, I got to smite myself instead of smiting you, instead of smiting me? Because what he just said, I'm not going to smite no living thing, right? But yet he was already alive in the spirit with, his, with Jesus as the pre-incarnated version of him in that realm. I was like, Lord, let me make certain my little thing because the enemy be working. I had to plug up my thing, y'all. But look at this. He said, I'm not going to smite anymore everything living as I've done. But instead, God already had a plan to send himself to be taken up on that cross and to die for us. Y'all really think about this when you think about going into the presence. Because I'm going to tell you right now, with the oak that God is speaking about, you are bringing your presence into atmospheres that God is telling you not to be in no more. A lot of us have been told to leave places and leave things behind. Yet, what do we do? What do we do? We literally bring what we have offered up unto God, our lifestyles into ungodly things that God told us to come out of. Now, if God has given you a mission and a mandate to go and minister, to do whatever you do, you have that permission to bring his presence. But the minute you go ahead on without it, this is what it is that happens. See, what I love about this, he said, now, Noah, while he was walking with God, he was asked to build an ark for himself and instructed to have a pair of everything, male and female, to reproduce in the future after God would destroy the earth with a flood. This statement reflected God command 
to Adam to be fruitful and multiply. God was using Noah and his covenant to remedy the effects of the disturbance of the earth that happened between Cain and Abel and what happened in the garden. See, the ark Noah built represented God's sacredness and protection and ability to be purged and cleansed his way to enjoy a covenant with him. You need to be in the ark of the covenant with God because your altar need to be altered and then you need to become a new priest. Your priesthood need to change into the image of Christ. After leaving the ark, we see God then introduced us to the word altar. So I had to lay it up. I know it sounds like I'm intertwining the message, but it all makes sense. After leaving the ark, we see God then introduce us to the word altar. Noah building the ark represented the, the new covenant, the first new covenant, right? Because the covenant from Adam and Eve was the first covenant on the earth. But I'm talking about the new covenant that began mankind with Abraham, Adam, I mean, Isaac and all of that going forward. It reestablished on the earth and now a new altar that would produce a sacrifice acceptable unto the Lord in the earth. Because you do know that the earth is an altar. That's why when the Lord speak in scripture, I will swallow up things in the earth. He can swallow up altars, baby. He can swallow up demonic altars and things that are not in his presence if you command them to. That's why God gave Adam and Eve dom dominion over the earth. Because when we speak to the earth, we're speaking to the altar of the Lord. Go back to Psalms 24. He said what? The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and those that dwell in there. See, we forget that a part of God's word, which is his covenant, which is his presence, began to tell us the directions and the instructions of what we can do. Many of us are dealing with evil altars because we don't know how to begin to command and demand them to fall down. We don't know how to begin to eradicate under the power of Jesus, under the blood that was shed for us. Look what he said. He said, the first human sacrifice was the cause of God's plan to never have another human sacrifice whose blood was polluted that could not redeem mankind unlike himself, who is Jesus Christ, who came in the flesh. See, now we're going to get y'all, let's switch to altar. We're going to now switch to the definition of the altar. Why did I speak first of ark? The ark of covenant represented presence and the ark of covenant represented the spiritual realm where you're going to begin to do transactions. You can't do transactions on your altar first without coming into divine coverings and presence. That's why when satanic priests and people that are witches and warlocks, they go meet on mountains. I mean, let's be very real. We see right now they got prophets lying up there talking about they going on mountains and rivers and hikes and cocks, whatever they got going on, talking to their other deities. That's how God is when he be like, come up here to the mountain of the Lord and dwell with me in my presence. And when you dwell with me in my presence, you're under my covering. And when you're up under my covering, I can begin to do a new thing in you. I can begin to make transactions on you in your soul. I can begin to exchange the things that are hurting you, harming you for the things that I want to give you, for the generational blessings that I want to release unto you and allow you to walk out of the generational curses. So look what an altar is. An altar is defined as a structure on which sacrifices are offered or incense is burned. A table used as the center of ritual or worships. In the Bible, the most infamous building of altars were associated with Moses and David, where they worship and praise God with sacrifices offered up that had to be from a pure place. Y'all, y'all, we have to offer up worship unto the Lord. What you do and how you live determines how your altar in your soul is going to be manifested with your body as a sacrifice, whether unto the Lord or whether unto the other kingdom. See, God knew after Noah left the ark, y'all, right? To remain in covenant, there must be sacrifices made unto the uh, Lord for the rest of his life while he was on earth. Look at, let's now look at also Exodus 25 and 10, and let's begin to look at how ark is going in. And we always talked about how ark goes before altar. Have them make an ark of a K of wood, two and a half cubits long, and a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold. 
Your art got to be pure because your altar need to be pure. Both inside and out. Make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to four feet and with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then the poles of Achaia wood and uh, of the other. Make, then make the poles of Achaia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry it. The poles are to remain with the rings of the ark. They are not to be removed. Then put the ark in the tablets of the covenant of the law. You won't, the reason you need to deal with ark of covenant and altars because you're going to be dealing with the law of God. The Lord did not do away the, with the law. Yes, the Lord did away with ritualistic and ritualisms and rituals. But he did not do away with his law. The word of God is his commandment. When you look up the word commandment, it means law. So that means that we transact from whether we are obeying God's laws or disobeying God's law. And look what he said. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and cubic and half wide. And make two cherubim out of the hammer gold. And at the ends of cover it, make one cherubim on one end and the second cherubim on the other. And make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face earth, other looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put it in the ark tablets of the covenant law and I will give it to you. It's all about covenant. The ark is about covenant. The laws are given. And then when you go before God in your soul, your laws got to be able to be written upon your heart. The laws of God need to be on your heart. If they're not and there's other stuff in place, then there are other altars that are taking place in your life. He said, there above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the covenant law, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for Israel. God is not just dealing with the commands of Israelites. He's still dealing with the commands of us. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He's saying, if you love me and you want to dwell with me, keep my word. Don't change the things of me, which are going to be eternal for the things of this world. See y'all, the ark mirror was a mirror of the garden of Eve, Eden, when Adam and Eve were in the garden. Remember when Adam and Eve were both covered up with the cherubims and that escorted them out and a cherubim that was put in place by God to protect the entrance into the dwelling of God in the garden. Ain't that the makeup of the tabernacle y'all? When that's the makeup of the tabernacle, it's saying it needs to be guarded, it needs to be protected because it's holy. That's remember, we talked about, and we're, if you did the class of mentorship, we talked about angels and what a cherubim is. And what those cherubim represent is to guard the holiness, the righteousness, the nature and the character of God. See, the cherubims are referred to as angels. God, again, fulfilling his word as it is in heaven and is on earth. Y'all remember, God always have a plan to rescue mankind back to himself. But will you return back to his presence? See, arcs and altars go together because they bring the presence of God with sacrifices made to God due to our obedience, which allows true communion with God. If we are to compare Jesus' endless obedience to God that led to the ultimate sacrifice for mankind, couldn't we say that Jesus' life was not only an ark for God's presence to dwell, but also an altar that made a sacrifice that was to restore all forever let's look at it therefore we are asked to be new creatures in christ and die to ourselves as in second corinthians 5 and 17 or then let's go to romans 12 1 and 2 we need to make our lives a living sacrifice which is pleasing unto the lord unto god for us to commune, continuously commune with him the reason you're not hearing God is because you're not allowing a presence to be built in your life to sustain for God to be there. You're not allowing yourself to be a living sacrifice so that you can say, hey, I'm an altar unto you. I want to transact with you, God. I want to change. If you're in the courts of heaven, there's a thing called trading floor. And it's in scripture when the Lord, when the Lord Jesus changes your rags and your filth or your sadness, for his joy, for his oil of gladness and stuff like that. 
What you are doing when you go onto trading floors in the courts of heaven, you are changing your destiny for what God already spoke in the heavens, for what the altars that are speaking in your bloodlines, for what the altars that are speaking in your ancestors. If you want to know why you're dealing with not being able to get pregnant, why you're not being able to get married at your age, why you're dealing with delay and setback. It's because there are altars in our bloodlines that are speaking and we have yet to deal with them. There are altars. Yes, there is more than one altars. When I do deliverance and inner healing, I have to tear down multiple altars in Jesus' name. I have to shut down altars of mammon. I have to shut down altars of Jezebel. I have to shut down altars of Asherah and, and Molech. I have to shut that. And you got to go through each bloodline because sometimes there are altars that are so hidden and so stubborn until you get deep in your deliverance and in your healing, the Lord can begin to allow you to hear because the more you're cleansed of altars of the world and altars of what your family placed you in, the more God can allow his covering to come over you, the presence to overtake you and you to be altered at the altar he is offering you. So just as there are altars, y'all, that are built unto the Lord, that are there are also evil altars that are set up by the kingdom of darkness. These altars are set up through contracts and covenants that was entered in through our ancestors. Y'all, we see a reflection of that when Moses came down, right? And he came to meet the Israelites. And what, what they did, he only found a golden calves built and sacrificed and being offered up to other gods. Notice it was golden. You got to understand, Satan counterfeits everything that God does. So why won't he put it to be gold? That's the pro That's also the problem with the Israelites. They keep trying to offer up a tent, offer up idols and worship and, and, and food unto something that is tangible. They can touch, they can see in the natural. That's why they lack faith. That's why they died in the wilderness because they lack the ability to see beyond their natural eyes and get activated in the spiritual realm. See, we also see this is a place throughout the Corinthians church where Paul had to continually correct the Gentiles who were in covenant with the pagan gods that were built in Romans. So if you in a fraternity, you in a sorority, your mama Freemasonry, your mama order needs to start your daddy, baby, y'all in witches and warlocks. You in a covenant, because guess what's going to happen? When you get inducted into Freemasonry and order of the Eastern Star, they're going to come back to collect on your child. Uh, and, if, and let me tell you something. This is the stupidest thing you could say. Hear me when I say this with love. I say this with all love and humility. It is ignorant to think that you can denounce and renounce soul ties and connections, but yet say you still part of the organization. Make it make sense for the people in the back. Make it make sense. That's like you saying, okay, me and my husband, Lord, we ain't together no more, but we still married on paper. You still in the covenant. You ain't free to go roam around and play Oopa Troopa. You're not free to go be slanging your stuff or woman or going anywhere, being in another relationship because you're still bound by that contract. You're still bound by that covenant, right? So this is the thing. If you are participating, if this is worshiping other gods, if you're worshiping false religions, anything that has become Lord over your life instead of Jesus, who is God, you have another altar. Baby, if you addicted to vanity, that's an altar. Get it up. If you addicted to your looks, that's an altar of self. Go on, shoot it down. If you addicted to having security in yourself, that's an altar. That security in self allows you to not be able to transact from God. It creates a poverty mindset, a poverty spirit. You allow the spirit of Beelzebub, that's the principality of poverty, to dwell in your bloodline and on your life and you wonder why you're going into ruins. Ask yourself that. Or is money your idol or God is going to be your Lord? Is money going to continue to be your idol? If you are fearful of dying, if you're fearful of being rejected, you fear men, you fear anything except the Lord, let me tell you, 
You are welcoming contracts, altars, and deities. And that is how the enemy got access. If you fail to get evicted, baby, just stop, stop being afraid to get evicted. We we this ain't gonna be our homes anyway, y'all. This is this is etern this is not eternity. Stop being afraid to lose your house, your cars, or under that because God gonna be like, I'm gonna keep going through that cycle with you and keep bringing you into ruins until you let that idol go. I'm gotta if God wants to alter your altars, He gotta destroy them. Let's get a revelation. Your altar got to be destroyed. Either the presence of the Lord is going to dwell and you change your altar to be altered to the Lord Jesus, or you're going to allow God to keep smashing down the things in your life. If you've been asking God today for prophetic insight, here it goes. The clarity is if you keep trying to hold on, trying to pay your bills, if you keep trying to hold on to make sense of things in the spiritual for the natural, you are continuously are going to go into ruins. But I'm a living testament. I am an epistle to tell you when you let that stuff go, there's a freedom. You ain't in bondage. You ain't in change. Satan can't touch you. Satan can't touch a person that don't fear losing anything but losing the Lord. Let me say this again. Satan can't touch a believer who don't fear anything but the Lord. Because the Lord said in scripture, the fear of the Lord is safety, is security, is trust. That's what you do when you exchange your soul, your wounds, your hurt, your pain, your bitterness, your anger, your perverted thought process, your imagination, your sexual appetites, your desires of this world and say, Father, I surrender it unto you. Jesus, you died for me. Cleanse me with the blood. Cleanse me and wash me and make me new. Once you begin to do that, you begin to get altered for the Lord. See, you got to understand, this is where we get into a place where we have to go through a process of renunciation, y'all. We have to get out of contracts and covenant with those little gods, and we got to get back to our first love, our one God, Savior, our Lord, over our lives. That's what an altar does. An altar is dealing with the soul of a man because the Satan has to allow your soul to perish to be in damnation. That is what he's contending against. Satan ain't contending against anything but that soul, which is the living bread. If you look at the word soul in both Hebrew and the word both Greek, you get nefesh and you get psych, you get suke, which comes out of the word psychology. So you're getting into the place of where you think of consciousness in your soul. And then you think of the place of where you think of the inner abode, the emotions. You get into the Hebrew and Greek word of heart, where you get the word lab, right? And then you get another part of another part of what his heart is talking about. That's why you get the word heart and mind interchangeably because it's dealing with the comprise of your soul. That is where all the exchanges are done on the altar. And the more you are broken, the more you are unhealed, the more your soul is fragmented into the spiritual realm connected to Tommy and Boo Boo the Foo Foo is the more you will have other altars. Some of you need to get delivered from spirit spouses. Yes, if you played Mario Smash Brothers before you got married, guess what? You need to go on disconnected. If you played Mario Smash Brothers even with your husband before you got married or your wife, you have to go break that ungodly soul tie from your fragmented soul because it's going to keep remembering what you both did before the marriage. Because when you come into the presence, which is the ark and the covenant of God, you come into the unity where God begins to alter you in his presence. He begins to change your soul appetite. He begins to change your desires. He begins to change your will to align with him. Come on now. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, and that's the thing, demons, people that are devils, worshipers, have altars in their homes, altars in their cars, altars at their job. You don't think we need to build the altar of the Lord, but I know Prophet Obi gonna really hit on it when I finish and I'm almost done. But I'm telling you, you gotta understand that this is serious. When you do not take your life 
to be altered by God, but continuously live in a place where you don't deal with these areas of your soul, you are going to continuously be going in a roundabout self-sabotaging spirit world. See, altars and arcs never stop playing a vital role in believers' lives. How do I know that? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever in Hebrews 13 and 8. In Matthew 15, 5 and 17, Jesus tells us, he did not do, abolish the law of the prophets, but to fulfill through it through his blood shed, affording grace, mercy, and favor that we can abide in. The blood gives us access to transform our lives into a living sacrifice, which is an altar unto the Lord and places our lives to be in the covenant, which is the Ark of the Covenant where God's presence can remain with us. Baby, God needs to see blood dripping. You crying about the stuff you're going through. You crying about your trials. Baby, congratulations. You're building an altar into the Lord. You crying about what you don't got. You crying about this and that. Let me tell you again. This is you building an altar to the Lord. When you go through hits and blows, when you go through people backbiting, when you go through people spewing lies on you, when you go through betrayal, when you go through that hurt, when you go through that divorce that you didn't want to go through, when you go through all of these things, when you had an abortion and you didn't want to have one or you intentionally had one, when you do that, but you go and renounce all of those things, you're saying, God, I'm renouncing the blood that I've shared in my human mindset and carnality, but now I'm coming into the blood of Jesus to shed and cleanse me. Because Jesus said in Ephesians 5 and 26, I may cleanse you with the blood and the washing of the water with his word. That's how powerful the word of God is. Look what he said, and I'm gonna wash you with the water. When the ark was built, it was built to protect from the judgment of water. See, water is dual. Water is used to cleanse and renew and refresh, but water was also used to judge the earth. So when you start seeing rainstorms and hails and everything, know that there is judgment in the earth. So God is saying through Jesus Christ's sacrifice, we have the ability to defeat the enemy with false contracts, false covenants, and curses that was given to us due to man's fall. It is only through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross we have victory to destroy every works of the enemy in our lives. The blood destroys false covenants, y'all, and contracts, while his blood reestablishes our covenant with God. This is why, let me tell you again, this is why you have to invoke the blood of Jesus. A lot of believers don't understand that when you are born again, yes, we got victory, but you got to go and nail that stuff to the cross, nailing it to the cross saying, I plead the blood of Jesus. God, I come out of agreement. We see this in Daniel 9. Daniel 9 is the premises for us to repent for the land, repent for a nation, to repent for a people, and to repent for yourself. So that, look, we got biblical scripture, baby, to back it up. The whole chapter, go read Daniel 9. It will take you, it will take you through the whole moment of how you need to cleanse your life. A lot, he said it. What did he say in 2 Chronicles 7, 14? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves in order to enter the ark, you got to go low. I need to get in the presence, God, because my heart needs to be right with you. I need to get in the peace of you, God, because I can't do nothing for you. How do I know that? Because Jesus showed us the truth of humility. He said what? He humbled himself unto death. Although he was equal with God, he counted himself not so. He didn't even steal. He said, I'm not going to count myself robbery because I know what I came to do in the earth. I know what I came to do. I know I came to set up a new altar. See, the earth had the altar of Abel blood crying out. And we know that blood had sin in it. We know that blood was just a representation of what Christ would do in the earth. But see, when, when Jesus died on that cross and when he began to share, a new altar was evoked but we don't put them in place. We don't tell the Lord, let's swallow up the altars in the earth. We don't tell the Lord, get rid of the spirit spouse. We don't tell the Lord, okay, I'll burn off the fibroids off of my, off of my, uh, in my womb. 
You got the right to command and demand and destroy wicked works against you. Because the enemy is coming for your altar because he know that if he can alter your altar, he can keep you out of the presence of God. And if he can keep you out of the presence of God, he can keep you being a priest to him. So let's go on to what it says in priests. One who serves as a high level minister with special privileges and access to a deity to the deity employing him and her. So that means that priests don't just belong to God. They got priests for Satan. He said, a mediator between God and his people. The role the New Testament church fills as the new creation priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, there are three priesthoods that are presented in the scripture. It is Melchizedek. Um, we have Melchizedek. And then we have Levitical priesthood, which is known as the Aaronic priesthood or Aaron's priesthood when they were there. This is the tribe of Levi. And then there's the new creation with Christ. And what most people don't fail to realize, Moses was still a priest. Although he didn't, although he responded more so in his office as a prophet and a judge, he was still responding in a sense to God as a priest. Now, the connection God wanted him to make was, okay, Moses, you come and talk to what you do. I need you to act as a priest unto me by speaking first to Aaron. And then what Aaron did, Aaron became a priest unto the people on behalf of God. But it was really, he said, on behalf of Moses. You go read in the scripture. He said, I will make what you are to me, Aaron, what is to you. All right, we about to go here. Some of you need to get into a place where you are with godly covenant partners. Because Aaron was positioned with Moses, which was the ability to get the blessing and to receive from God. Sometimes it's not just about the process, proximity and the access, but it's really about the learning. It's really about the understanding. If you go back between the relationship with Moses and Joshua, Moses really discipled Joshua, y'all. I'm telling you, Moses successfully discipled Joshua because it was Joshua and Caleb that was able to fulfill the land of what God wanted when he appointed him. And what did what did Joshua do? Joshua observed the relationship between God and Moses. Joshua observed the things that Moses did. Some of you really need to sit down and just wait and learn and sit under some people. I like the line. If you got, if God is telling you something different, but I'm just telling you, you would be blessed when you get in the presence of the Lord because somebody is carrying His presence. Now, don't go be sitting over there with these soothsayers and these nonchalants and these wickers and all of that. But really, ask the Lord, Lord, who do you, who voice do you want to assign to me in this season as you assign Joshua voice to Moses? I mean, Moses voice to Joshua. Like when Joshua heard his calling, the first thing Moses told Joshua, you about to fight, go to war. Immediately, he literally mentored, discipled him and told him, this is what you're called to do. Joshua was militaristic in his prophetics, like Deborah. He fought. The reason I'm over here, because I'm trying to make you to get a connection between how Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit relationship is. Everything is about them having a unity and a oneness and even surrendering and a submission to one another. Jesus was to glorify the Father. The Father was to glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit was to glorify Jesus. They both would speak of the name Jesus and who he was. So let's go to this thing when we're about to close out. He said in Genesis 14, this is Melchizedek, the king of Salem. A lot of said Melchizedek. I'm just laughing at what I just said in my mind. Who is the priest of what the most high God is. This is where you see the introduction to the system of tithing between Abraham and Melchizedek. If you don't tithe and if you're not believing in tithing, let me tell you something. Just go let that bird keep eating up your house because your house going to keep getting devoured because this ain't got nothing to do with no law. Before the law of Moses and everything that he enacted in ex Exodus came about, baby, there was already a principle. See, we yeah, there is the laws of God, but in, within the laws of God are principles that you need to comply with. When you comply with the principles, you get the right transactions. And then he said, and Melchizedek, 
king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the highest God. Now we know that's the Lord Jesus, the Father in heaven. He, we know Salem stands for the king of peace. And we know this is a reflection of who y'all, the prince of peace. And then there's the Levitical priesthood. This was established through the tribe of Levite, what I just told y'all. They were considered to receive the Lord as their inheritance and referred to even as the Aaronic priesthood. With the Levitical priesthood, I'm going to tell you right now. Remember, they could not transact as priests and as kings and do those different things. That was two different separate things. When they operated under the Levitical priesthood, I'm telling you right now, they could not be priests and kings. But when they came under the Viticate, which is all going to be aligned under to the new covenant, they were able to be priest, prophet, and king. And this makes some sense of where I'm about to go. Why am I mentioning priesthood and priests? It's relevant for discussing the Ark of the Covenant and altars. Well, it is because the role and function of a priest is the one that has access to the holies of the holiness and make intercession and sacrifices on behalf of the people. Some of your family members dying because your priesthood is trash. I know they hurt what I just said. I know it hurt, but I'm going to be real with you. You ain't raising no dead in Jesus' name because your priesthood got 50 altars on it. Your priesthood got Beyonce on it. Your priesthood got Rihanna on it. Your priesthood got some flesh on it. Your priesthood got Webby and Bootsy still on it. Your priesthood still got a lot of things of this world on it, and you cannot stand in a gap for your family members. Let's make it make sense. Because see, when you are coming behind the veil, and it's not just music, your lifestyle, that's where we're getting into. Your priesthood is your bodily functions. You got to understand, when you move in the earth, you are making a sound. When you move in the earth, you are telling hell and heaven, I am making a decree. What did he tell Joshua? He said, oh, the days of your lives, I'm going to be with you as I with Moses. He said, wherever your feet will tread, I will be with you. You got dominion. You got authority. Did, that, did he not tell that to Adam and Eve? Everywhere in the earth, you got dominion and authority. Every act that you do. Come on, prophet. Look, prophet Obi is flowing in this thing. She got to understand it. Because a Levite going to sacrifice their physical inheritance to receive the presence of God. Name your Ezekiel prophets. Baby, I had to sacrifice everything to allow the altar of the Lord to speak in my life. For people to hear God accurately, they don't need xenophobia, elephants, and opinions. They don't need biasness. They don't need her nonsense. All they need is the voice of God that is speaking. And the only way you can do that is understand that you're going to sacrifice your life. You're, you, you are, I'm telling you, you're going to give up a lot of things when you're sacrificing in the beginning. Because God is taking you from transitions and from glory to glory, from faith to faith. You can't house the glory of God with a tainted altar. You can't go into the presence with a tainted altar. You can't go into the presence without your priesthood being established. A lot of us don't operate as priests in our families, and it shows. Your prayer life is lacking, your prayerlessness. You want everybody to pray for you, but you pray. You're lazy. And you wonder why your altar is constantly filled with demonic influence. The devil know that if I can shut you up to pray, but I'm going to keep praying with my witches and warlocks on 24-hour watchmen do this, I've got you. I've got you. Because a priest is associated with a sacrifice. It's saying, I got to go for it. See, a priest can come behind the veil. See, you must have a, in order for you to come behind the veil, there must be a transaction is where you have laid down your carnality and you allow the worship of the Lord to go forth. Some of us got stinky priesthoods that are going up to the Lord. Your incense stink. Your incense stink. Because we got stuff that need to be filtered out. Look what Revelation 1 and 16 says. I mean, 1 and 6 says, and he has made us unto him, which is Jesus, a kingdom of kings and priests. Y'all, 
We now got authority as kings to rule and reign. We now got ability to go behind the veil and be seated with Jesus. Because ain't the scripture said we are seated in heavenly places. When he rose up and ascended from his dissension, we were seated right along with him. Why are you letting everybody else sit on the altar of your heart? Why are you letting every other altar alter your life and allow you to be a priest unto Satan and not a priest completely unto God? When the Lord began to talk, he said, then many are failing to enter into covenant with God and transact on the altar of the Lord because we are serving a priest of another kingdom. We are serving as priests for another kingdom. When you don't live a life that is required of God, which is his word, the same requirements that the Ark of the Covenant spoke of, of Moses to enter into, and even for David to hold on to in order for the requirements to be met, was the same way that Jesus had to be able to ascend and become under the throne room and the presence of God and be behind the veil. We can't enter behind the veil unless we have lived a life of consecration, holiness, purity, and righteousness. Y'all, holiness is still the standard. God is not raising us up to be whoremongers. Y'all, we live that life in the streets. Baby, if he redeemed Rahab and Gomorrah, he redeeming me and you. We don't need to be pimping our bodies, ourselves, be on Instagram, thinking we need to compare ourselves to everybody else. No, you have been altered at the altar of the Lord. So being in relationship and covenant with God and going behind the veil with his son, Jesus require you to act as his priest, as Jesus is our high priest. So the last thing I just wanted to share with you is like, will you become a priest unto the Lord? Will you allow your altars to be dealt with? Will you allow, once your altars are dealt with, when you decide to stand as a priest for God, you are going to see the presence of God on your life like never before. I'm telling you, I got a testimony that's loading, low, low, loading, because I literally waited with God. And I'm not talking about, oh, then it's 10 minutes from now. To, no, 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 no. This testimony going to be popping. I've already got 50 testimonies because I surrendered, y'all. I died in that wilderness. I died. Like when I say I died, I said, God, here's my blood. Here's my law career. Here's my old relationship that didn't work out with this man. Oh, God, here's the broken pieces of my heart with my mom, with my dad, with other relationships of friendship. My God, you know what? Here's the relationship with where bosses mistreated me. I don't have a church issue with people, but I did have an issue with prophetic people in the beginning that were operating in divination. And I was like, here, God, there may be some residue there. Because even though I don't struggle with unforgiveness towards people, I'm going to be a fool and clown myself to say it can't slip up on me suddenly. And I'll be all of a sudden have bitterness within my heart, right? I'll have bitterness and resentment that will sneak up on me because I would fool and deceive myself that I don't have no sin. That's what you do when you don't allow your all to be altered that's what we do and you don't allow it to be in the covenant because you got to think of this i hope you get this demonstration you want a godly marriage a root them altars you want a godly friendship a root them altars because i'm gonna be real with you some of your altars be speaking against your godly covenants them wicked altars be speaking against the friends god i'm gonna tell you this satan hate godly covenants and let's, let's have a real talk before we transition to Prophet Obi real quick. <clears throat> it won't be long. When we realize that you're going to feel all of these things in your covenant, you can lie to xenophobia, but you can lie, not lie to the Holy Spirit. You're going to feel all these things, and my mentor said it. Don't matter what you feel or they feel, or if they have a moment, you better ride or ride with them. Do you hear me? She said, you, they may feel moments of jealousy, envy, hurt, and it's not them. It's just their unhealed wounds that are manifesting. And what he said, a love covers a multitude of sins. When you're really wanting to do life with that person, you're going to fight for them. You're going to fight for them. You're going to fight to be in relationship with them. You're going to say, God, I know this devil's working on my brother. I know that devil working on my sister. But you know what? I'm about to go in the court to heaven. She may have an attitude with me today, but it's okay, God. I'm not about to walk in the fence. My sister hurting. Let me lift her up to the Lord. My sister is bleeding. Let me cover her from people that are trying to keep continuously watching her bleed. You're going to go through that. You want to know what a real covenant looks like? You're going to go through trials. 
You're going to talk about the hard things that you really never talked about with anybody. You even shared with 20 year friendships. You're going to talk about things in your marriage. You don't share with nobody. You're going to talk about embarrassments and all of that. But my God, when you walk in a godly covenant, you begin to say, I'm a deal with altars. And I'm, I can honestly confess, for me, I suppressed a lot of my emotions. I didn't even know what I was feeling. But if it wouldn't have been for Prophet Obiyama as my sister and covenant partner helped me to explain and understand some things in me, I wouldn't have been able to, to develop at the level that I'm at. She sees my blind sides as well as Prophet Jen. We see each other blind sides and ain't nobody gonna talk about them to me crazy. Now you can say you discern your moments, but I'm going to stop it if you start getting gossiping. I'm going to stop it if you start being messy. I'm going to stop it and say, okay, bring this to your sister. You got to art with her. You got to art with my sister. And she's your sister in Christ. Go bring it to her. But I'm, and I'm not saying that if you have a moment, you're trying to discern something because that's different. We're trying to figure stuff out. But I'm just saying that you want godly covenants and soul ties. Break them evil altars. Break that jealousy. Break that spirit of comparison. Break that envy. Break that pride. Break, break that it's all about me. When will you celebrate them? Can you honestly celebrate them while your, while your life looks like it's in the third world country and they look like they're in luxury? Can you really celebrate them? Because I'm telling you, if, when you can do that, <laughs> man, it's a joy it, and it's an honor. It's an honor. Me and my three siblings, which I'm talking about my sister Jen and Obi, are in different seasons, but we actually in the same season now. It's like we always in the same season. We was just being processed according to our callings and according to what we've been through. And if I would allow myself, right, or Satan to get the best of me to be like, huh, they don't understand you. They don't understand you walked away from your career and woo, 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 woo. They mandate wasn't to walk away from their career. It was mine. That some of you need to get delivered from that too. It was not their mandate to walk away and put their career down. They are wealth builders. They are not called to be an equipper. They equipper, but not at the level that I'm called to. They are called to be kingdom financier. What I'm gonna finance? Three. That's gonna. I'm gonna do it, but they're gonna be like down the line. That is not my dominant trade. So that's what I'm trying to speak to y'all about. If you see beyond all of that, you see beyond that and not get worried. That's what kept me because I understood my sister's mandate wasn't mine, but they my sister's mandate complimented my mandate. And not only my mandate, it complimented my daughterhood. It built my character. It built me to be a better woman. A woman you see today is because of God putting them in my life. And I got two other friends that are just as godly that they met. And they can tell you that there's fruit on all of their lives that I am a product of. I am a product of Prophet Obi's fruit. I'm a product of Prophet Jen's fruit. I am the fruit they produce. The hill version of Zen you see today, the ability to communicate well, to understand my emotions, to break through barriers, to come out of timidity, to launch, to do all these different things. If it wasn't for my siblings and I dealing with evil altars that wanted to suppress me, dealing with arrested development spirits, dealing with these things. If I wouldn't have never said, God, I don't care. I'm going to deal with this. I'm not losing my sisters for no foolishness because my mentor had prepared me well. She said, it don't matter what they go through. It don't matter if they act crazy, you act crazy. Y'all going to be all crazy together. But you better ride it out with them because that's your godly covenant partners that's going to hold you. That's your tribe. And she said, but then she said, when you deal with them evil altars, she said, y'all going to see stuff better than before. And you need to be patient with your siblings. Be patient with the people God put in your life. You didn't have it all together. Stop acting like you just great. I mean, you're great, but you ain't that great. Come on now, only Jesus is that great. I'm just being real. Like, they're, they, they listen, care about their soul. Care about them enough to say, I'm going to put me down. And I'm not talking about false humility, but I'm saying not to worry about me. And I'm like, God, is this the season where I need to partner and I need to make certain my sister will, the will of God is being fulfilled in my sibling's life. So I just wanted to share that with you. This is what it looks like when you get altered 
by the altar of the Lord and you get into his presence and you be a priest. And because I'm a priest, I can pray for my siblings and I know that God gonna hear my prayers and he gonna answer. So that's what I got for y'all. I pray that y'all enjoyed the teaching. Holy Spirit just really jumped that out from thin air. Shout out to Prophet Obi because that's their teaching from 2022. Me and Prophet Obi didn't get to finish and the Lord just added a razzle dazzle. So shout out to the Lord. Shout out to the uh, Prophet Obi when I first met in the guy. Boo boo. Hello. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel like I'm in church. I want to collect the offering. I feel good. I feel blessed. Praise him. Yeah, so good. Um, phenomenal. Totally agree. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that as we're talking about altars, we're also talking about covenants. Because really, that's what we're talking about friendships. We're really talking about covenants, right? Um, know all people that you call your friends, you're not going to be in covenant with them. But covenants are ratified at altars. Ratified means um, brought to the point of acceptance, right? Because at an altar is where blood is shed and there's no covenant that you will see in scripture where there is not blood shed to say, yes, this, this covenant is good. This covenant is pure. This covenant is righteous. And so I don't think it's a coincidence that the Lord is just intermixing these two words and even the, the warnings against just, you know, dealing with what you got going on so that the Lord can puts you in godly community and in godly covenants because we really do need each other unfortunately not one person um yes ma'am not one person is is an island by themselves and so i'm just i'm grateful i'm grateful to god for the ability to be in community with these women real quick let's hit it um prophet zen laid a beautiful foundation um of what an altar is before you can have an altar you must 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 have a um sorry altars are all about a presence you have a deity that you're worshiping so just like prophet zen said demons have altars witches have altars altars are not exclusive to the kingdom of light because altars are how all spiritual beings transact on an earthly domain right if you are a spirit in order for you to have any kind of impact on earth in the natural world there must be an altar that is connecting with you in the realm of the spirit to bring about your desires in the earthly domain. So all spirits have altars and all altars have priests that tend to them. And so even the idea or the evolution of the or the prophets, the priests was because God needed intercessors. Priests are truly intercessors. Prophets were those who came with the message of the Lord. They came and they said, I, I represent my deity. My deity says this, but then God said, hey, the prophet came, but there's no one telling me what the people require from them to me. And so he said, okay, now I need the office of a priest. I need a priest to go before me to say, um, yeah, the people are doing this. The people are doing that. Have mercy on their souls. And so the office of the priest and the prophet are so pivotal. But then just as prophets then spoke to him, we have in the New Testament, the king, right? The Levitical priesthood, they didn't have access to inheritance because the Lord says, I am your inheritance, right? You come into this you get access to my presence. No one else had access to the presence of the Lord, but the priesthood. Now we come into the New Testament and Jesus pays the price because access to the presence of God costs blood. That's why altars require covenants. You cannot talk to the realm of the spirit unless there's a sacrifice made. When you guys think about people like Summer Walker and why do they, why are they cutting chicken and, and why are all these, why are they killing babies? Blood. They need blood. Blood is what speaks. Blood is eternal. It's the lifeline. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word than that of Abel. Your blood is continuously speaking. And blood is what gives spirit realm beings access to speak in earthly domains. If a spirit being has not paid the price of blood, they don't have language or vocabulary to speak in the realm of the natural. And so priests were created to govern the access point from heaven to earth and earth, well, earth to heaven. Prophets were created from heaven to earth. So let's sit in that. Um, I want to go to the four altars of Abraham because I believe as prophets, this is what we go through the process or even as prophetic people, this is some of the, uh, the, the processes that we go through. So um, if you go with me to Genesis 12, seven, we're going to hit these really fast. Genesis 12, seven is the first altar that we see Abraham build. Now, Abraham built four altars. The number four, it was a representation of the earth, four corners of the globe, north, south, east, west, right? It's not a coincidence that he's called the father 
um, of many nations. It's not a coincidence. He's called the father of faith. It's not a coincidence that it's out of the seed of Abraham that God was going to bless the whole earth, right? And so Abraham has to establish these four altars, and these four altars are significant or symbolic for the four um, territories of the earth that Abraham would then be able to bless through his seed and through the ultimate promise that was in the form of Isaac and eventually in the form of Christ. So 12.7 says... I'm going to start at this, actually. Abraham passed through the land of the site of Shechem at the Oak of Moriah. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appealed to him. Okay, appeared to him. So this is the first time Abraham encounters the Lord. Well, the Lord tells him to move. Here, go to a land, I'll show you. Then this is the first time Abra um, the Lord actually appears to Abraham and says, I'm going to give you this land. Abraham says, bet, you know what I'll do? I'm going to build an altar to you. What does this have to do with prophets and prophetic people? When you look up the word Shechem, it means shoulder. What does your shoulder do? Your shoulder is the burden bearer. So really what God was introducing Abraham to, if he was attuned in the realm of the spirit, which he was, because we later find out, was the burden of the Lord. The Lord needed an inheritance. He needed a legacy. Noah and the generations before him had been wiped out through the flood. The earth was wicked. Even after the flood, the Lord said it's from the youth, the heart of humanity despises good. They seek after evil. And so God was saying, hey, I need a group of people that will seek after righteousness, purity, and truth in me. And so he raised up an Abraham. He literally picked Abraham out of all the, the, the um, heathens of the earth, right? Abraham was a was a, a, a Chaldean. They were star worshipers. They had alter, alternative gods. They loved worship of demonic deities because demonic deities were ran rampant. The Lord did not have any prophets who could confirm his identity to the people that he would entrust them to. And so Abraham was the one who was elected and selected. And the Lord sent him to a land that he would show him to separate Abraham from the deities of his forefathers that they used to serve. And so now we have Abraham having an encounter for the first time with the Lord. Yes, the Lord spoke to him, but the Lord never appeared according to scripture to Abraham until 12, seven. Now the Lord appears and an altar is built and the appearance of the Lord was to communicate the burden of the Lord. And it was a test. It said, essentially the Lord was saying, Abraham, will you bear my burden? My burden is I need an inheritance throughout the nations. I need a name. I need a conduit for my seed to flow through. I have this plan to redeem humanity. I know y'all are full of heathens. I done did the flood. I can't do that no more. I can't wipe nobody out. So now I need to come up with game plan that I put in my real game plan because the flood was just at least try to start with something decent. I need a real game plan. And the real game plan is to send my seed through the generations in the form of Christ. And I need one vessel that is worthy of my seed. Are you able to carry this burden? And so the Lord starts off real cute. He says, you know, look around, right? Verse six, when he passed through the land of Shechem at the Oak of Moriah, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your offspring, I will give this land. Not to you, to your offspring. You're talking a 75-year-old man that don't have no kids to your offspring. What offspring, Lord? Where are they at? Who? Because my wife has passed, you know, she don't have no period no more. So what offspring are you talking about? To your offspring. Are you going to believe the Lord? Why does the Lord want Abraham to carry? Or why does the Lord want to give to Abraham the land? And especially to his offspring, because the Lord needed Abraham to know that he was a generational God. I have a plan, not just for you, Abraham. I have a plan for your offspring, your seed, the generations to come. Can you bear the burden of the generations, Abraham? Abraham built the altar and ratified it, saying, yes, Lord, I accept this. I will bear the burden of the generations. Let me build an altar to commemorate this moment. Anytime we see an altar, altar serves as a memorial. It's a place of remembrance as well. It's not just a place where divinity meets humanity, right? It's a place of consecration. And it's also a memorial that reminds the priest that would approach that altar that there is a God that they are worshiping and that God can do or has done certain things. And so when Abraham built this altar, it was a remembrance that this God was speaking generationally and to the legacy of what was to come, even though the natural did not look like it. So the first altar that prophets, prophetic people have to be processed through is the burden of the Lord. The Lord will captivate you in a season and he will give you a burden that does not make sense to you, given the circumstances that you have. 
you single like why do i have a burden for marriage ain't no man in sight why am i praying for these kids where they at i don't got no kids of my own why am i here praying for marriages i'm partnering with marriages what does that look like what is this mess it's because the lord is testing your willingness to carry his burden he will lay a burden on your heart especially as a prophet or a prophetic person that does not make sense to your natural circumstances because he's testing your ability to carry out his will despite how little it seems to do with you first altar abraham had to start um had to build altar of burden then we go to uh verse at genesis 13 3 genesis 13 3 <laughs> and it says he went by stages from um the negev to bethel to the place between bethel and ai where his tent had formerly built to the site where he built an altar. Before this, he had built another altar. I'm sorry. He went back to the same altar. Sorry, y'all. Give me one second. He built another altar in verse 12, 8. So he built the first altar in um, 12, 7. Then he went to Bethel and Ai. From there, he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent. I'm reading 12, 8. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and he built an altar to the Lord. There, it's the second altar. And he called on the name of the Lord that Abraham journeyed by stages to Nagib. And then in 13.3, he revisits that same altar he built in 12.8. So he built an altar in 12.7. He built an altar in 12.8. Now the altar in 12.8, the first altar is the altar of burden. The, the second altar in 12.8, Genesis 12.8, the word Bethel is house of God. A-I, when you look up that word, it actually means to do or to make. So you have the house of God to the west and what is done or made to the east. And it was there that Abraham called on the name of the Lord. So now the Lord doesn't just appear to Abraham. Abraham has the ability to interact with the Lord and proactively call on his name. Interesting. Some also say that um, in this place, right, is where Abraham was recreated. So from the house of the Lord, in between the house of the Lord and in between um, and, and AI, which is to make or to do, Abraham received insight and wisdom that she tells him, this God can talk to me, but I too can talk to this God. This is the first time a man since the flood of Noah had talked to God and called upon the name of the Lord. Men now return to calling upon the name of the Lord again. So this altar represents the altar of recreation. As a prophet or a prophetic person, after you take on the burden of the Lord, there has come a season in your life where the Lord is testing your ability to come into the new format or the recreation, his new mind for you, right? It's not just him reaching out to you saying, I have something for you to do. Now it's you reaching out to him and saying, hey, I know um, you came to me in this season. Remember that promise you gave me? Remember that thing you told me to um, pray for? Remember that thing you promised me in, in the covenant that we used to ratify this altar? I'm reaching back out, Lord. What's going on? Or let me worship you. Or I believe that you are faithful and good. You spoke to me before. I'm speaking to you now. Abraham had to come to a place where he knew that he had the ability to talk to this unseen, untouched God. And this was a new, like, if you really think about it, it's so common to us because we go into our prayer closets or we go to our church and we can pray to God. But men did not pray to an unknown God. That's why they created these figures or these deities or they would build the golden calves because it was weird. Abraham was thought of to be weird to pray to this unseen, untouchable, unknown God. It did not make sense to those that were around him. Who are you talking to, Abraham? At least when the statue was there, we knew what was going on. But who, who, what air are you whispering to? I don't see nothing. Do you see something? And so Abraham had to come to the place where he understood, I am different. Altar of recreation. Let's keep going. As a prophet or prophetic person, you're going to get the burden. Then you have to come into the consciousness of the new you, right? You're not like the rest of them. You were created different. You have access to a God that they may not have access to based on their level of intimacy or their willingness to accept him as who he is. Are you going to look crazy to continue down the path that this God that you claim you heard has told you to continue down the path of? Abraham to circle back. He built the altar and he said, you know what? Let me circle back. You appear to me here. I'm, I built my altar here. Let me circle. Hey, hey, I feel a little crazy. Hey. This is me interjecting thoughts into scripture, but you get the understanding, right? Let's go to the third altar that he built. This is Genesis 13, verses 14 through 18. 13, 14 through 18. 
So after Lot had separated from him, the Lord said, Abraham, here comes God again with all these promises. Look from the place where you look north and south, east and west, for I will give you and your offsprings forever. All the land that you see, I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust of the earth, then your offspring will be counted. Get up and walk around the land through its length and width for I will give it to you. Verse 18, so Abraham moved his tent and went to live near the Oaks of Mamre at Hebron where he built an altar to the Lord. So it went from this is the land I'll give you to look, walk around, do a prophetic act. Believe me, come on prophet Zen, believe me. I'm gonna give you all of this. No baby in sight. To the point where Abraham was like, you ain't giving me a son. Is Eliezer is going to be my inheritor. He didn't tell that to God. He just built an altar to God the first time. But when the Lord kept appearing to me, he said, um, what's, how are we going to do this? The Lord went from, I'll give you this land to so walk around, the depths, the vastness. And this is after he gave Lot the choicest piece of land. Literally right before this verse, they were in a place. It was like, Lot, what do you want? Lot looked around. He saw the greenness of Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, I'm going to go there. Abraham said, okay, we'll make it do what it do here. And now the Lord is like, I'll give you everything. Wherever you can see, I'll give it to you. Interesting. So what does this altar refer to? What does the word Hebron mean? Hebron means to unite, to come into alliance, to go from a colleague to a friend. So this is when we talk about the verse that says Abraham was a friend of God. This is the altar that ratified that friendship because it was at Mamre or at Hebron that Abraham transitioned through his devotion to God, right? Because he's coming to his new creation to say, you know what, God, I believe that I can encounter you in this way. And I desire to come into friendship with you in a way that humanity has not come to friendship with you before. And so therefore, if you're telling me I'm going to inherit all of this, and this is going to be my offspring, I choose to believe you. The closest way to get intimacy or the easiest way to get intimacy with God is to believe him. That's why the enemy of your, of your soul fights you on the level of your faith. You get attacked at the promise because Satan wants you to call God a liar, just like he made Eve call God a liar, right? Did God really say that? Yes, he did. He said we couldn't eat the fruit. That's what she should have said. But no, she sat there and gave audience of the devices of the enemy to distract her and then what ended up happening intimacy was cut no longer did adam and eve have access to the garden where they would walk with god by the pool of the day now they were outside and they had flaming turbans keeping them from access points to god satan's whole desire is to pervert your viewpoint of god and to frame god as a liar because satan is the father of lies and he wants to take the place of god in your life and accuse god of being him he switches he's always trying to switch and so when god sat at hebron and continued to glorify himself by saying i'm gonna give you all this i'm gonna give you all this and abraham chose to believe god by establishing the altar it ratified their friendship it was at that point that god even in verse 18, it says, um, 18, 17, it says, should I do this thing unless I tell Abraham? And in Isaiah, I believe it's 41, 25, it says, Abraham, my friend. It was at that place that God said, no, this one is trustworthy because he believes me. He's not going to come back to me and say, mm, you sure? I don't know about that. This one is trustworthy. This one is worthy to be given the secrets of my heart to. So I'm going to tell him everything that pertains to my kingdom. Because I have a plan, not just for him, but I have a plan for the generations through him. So as a prophet or a prophetic person, there's going to come a point in your intimacy with God where your friendship with God will be tested. If you even have one. It's either you're going to start a friendship or your friendship is going to be tested. Why is that? Because God has to be able to not just, I, I'm glad you trust him, but can he trust you? Can he trust you with the vision? Can he trust you with the mandate? Have you been faithful to the burden? Have you been consistent in planning the flames of the altar? Will you make the sacrifice? He can't take you from um, zero to 100. Prophet Zen talked about it earlier. Altars require sacrifices. There was no way that God could have asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac if he had not established a friendship with him that where both of them knew that they could be trusted. When we talk about covenants, we're talking about friendship. When we talk about friendship, we're talking about covenants. And when we talk about altars, altars are where relationships are established. Some of you, God cannot trust you because you're not faithful and you don't trust him. He's giving you a burden, right? And Prophet Zen touched on it earlier. Sometimes we hear prophetic words and say, uh, we try to disassociate ourselves from it because it feels harsh. 
right? But he's giving you a burden. He's put you in some circles but because of fear of intimidation, because of evil altars in your life that are speaking against the will of God for you. You've come out of agreement or partnership with what God has said from the beginning. The burden he gave you, the call he placed on you, not for your name's sake, but for his name's sake. God wanted to be glorified through the seed of Abraham. It wasn't so that Abraham could have children. Appreciate you, Isaac, but your portion is Jesus. You are created so you could birth the Messiah. That was God's whole investment in Abraham. I need a conduit for the Messiah. I need a bloodline where Christ's seed can flow through. It was not so Abraham could have a child and say, oh my gosh, I love this child. And sometimes because we are prophets and because we identify so intimately with the living God, because we were created to do so, we confuse what God's heart is and what our heart is. What I mean to say is we think because it matters to us because of unhealed places or traumas or altars in our bloodline that that's what God cares about. God don't care about that stuff. He needs you clean. He needs you ready. He needs you prepared. He needs you heaving to the burden and coming into true friendship because he needs to use you. He requires you. If he didn't require you, he wouldn't have made you. Everything about God is intentional when it comes to us. Everything about God is intentional when it comes to the purposes or the plans that he has for us, right? Sometimes we think like, oh, you know, God called me to be a prophet. Woe is me. And I'm so guilty of this. Why is it so hard? Yeah, God needed Obiama. He needed xenophobia. He needed a Chanel. He needed an ebony. There was a burden he placed on each of us that could not be birthed unless we were in alignment and came into friendship with him so that we could properly steward the seed he wanted to produce through us. From the beginning, God's mandate has been fruitfulness. Even when Noah got off the ark, he told him, be fruitful and multiply. God is not worried about now. He's worried about generations. God lives outside of time. You know how to judge if you think like God, if your mind truly, we pray that verse, oh, let the mind that's in me also be. Yeah, when you're thinking about your now and your today, you're not thinking like God. God does not exist in your today. God exists outside of time. His time frame is Kairos. You live in Kronos, right? God is always is. Things are always happening. And so, when it's like, oh, it's my Kairos season. It's my Kairos season. No, no. God has an eternal Kairos season. He's always in Kairos. He's looking for you to partner with him by way of your altar to bring his reality into your chronology. That's why some people can pray and things happen immediately for them. Because they have access that was birthed through intimacy. Their altars have a flame and a sacrifice that does not go out. And so immediately they call on God the friend. And because he respects their relationship, he steps, he, he drops the kairos of his tangible existence into their chronology. Oh, you need a healing? Oh, beyond the bet. Drop. It's already done. I'm going to drop it into your chronology. Let it be so. Let it not be otherwise. But because you have not fanned the flame of your altar, right? Or you have other altars that are speaking against the altar that you're supposed to create with God. You struggling to get the airwaves up there. You struggling to get the message up there. And God is struggling to get it back down to you. Not because he does not desire to, but he's looking at you. Can you be trusted? If I give you the healing, are you going to come back to this altar? If I give you the promise, um, oh yeah, you going to pray again? If I made your life the way you wanted it to, am I going to see you? And so altars are to establish intimacy with us as well. Altars are memorials. Altars are where divinity means reality. Altars are also to establish intimacy, to test your trustworthiness. Can you be trusted? Okay, third altar, altar at Hebron. This is where God called or established his friendship with Abraham. This is the last altar, this altar that gets a lot of us, right? Altar at Moriah. Mount Moriah, this is where Isaac was sacrificed. This is Genesis 22, 9. When you look up the name Moriah, it means, um, it's also the place where Solomon's temple was built. But when you look up the name Moriah, there's some etymology or breakdown in the Hebrew that talks about it being um, bitterness of Yahweh. Now this sounds counterintuitive because, you know, I'm, I gotta partake in the Lord's bitterness. Why did God tests Abraham. He said, Abraham, will you sacrifice your only son? God knew exactly who Isaac was to Abraham. God knew exactly the value, the worth, because God already in his chronos did that with his own son. And so now, Abraham, we friends. 
I've shared my heart with you. I've given you my burden. We've established intimacy. I, you know me. I know you, right? How well do you know me? Am I really going to make you kill your son? But I'm going to ask you, but am I really going to do it? Am I going to make you do it? And that's what happens with those of us that get to that place of intimacy with God. Where right? you rock and you roll, you got the burden of the Lord, right? He's brought you into this new creation mindset where you know that you have access to this divine deity. He you pray, he answers. You call his name, you hear his voice. Okay, I can prophesy a little. I, I can hear the voice of God for other people and myself. I have a little plan for my future. Now you're friends. You feel like you want God friends. You know, he's telling you stuff. You're telling him stuff. All right, boom. Give me your law career. All right, boom. Give me your medical dreams. All right, boom. Give me your, your desire for marriage. Okay, boom. Give me your desire for them kids. Are you still going to serve me 12 years, no child, Hannah? You're going to serve me in the palace of the king that is of a, de a different deity, Esther? You still going to serve me Mary with no husband and ain't had sex yet and didn't even get to taste the good good but God got to be pregnant? You still going to serve me Zachariah? You mute though. Oh, but I'm going to bring a son through your wife. You can't say nothing. Hush. Because you might mess it up. Because that's the power of priesthood. As a priest, you have the ability, because you are God's intercessor to the people, you have the ability by opening your mouth to corrupt the plans of God. That's why the priesthood is so important. I'm so glad that Xenophobia touched on it when she was teaching, right? I'm not going to retouch on it, but I do want to emphasize this point. The priesthood matters. Who's standing the, who's standing the flames of the altar matters. Because the corrupt priest holds the corrupt altar. And so God had to shut Zachariah's mouth when he gave the promise of John the Baptist that would be birthed in Elizabeth's womb because Zachariah had too much doubt. And because he was a Levitical priest and he had ranking in his priesthood, he could have sat there and by way of his words, null and void, the altar that um, Lord, the prophetess Anna had been creating in that temple for all the years. Anna was on earth praying that the Messiah would come, that she would see his face, that she would behold his glory. Zachariah with one word could have null and void the altar that Anna had been standing for God knows how many years. And so the angel had to shut his mouth and say, no, 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 you're not talking. Be quiet. You go, right? You can tell him what I said, but you will not open your mouth and you will not be a negative altar to what has already been created on this earth. And so there comes a place in your walk with God, especially as a prophet, or even as a prophetic person, where you got to put something on that altar. You got to put the lifestyle on the altar, the music. Some, some of you, these associations, we're going to keep going back to it, the friendships, right? Loyalty is not a reason to remain in a relationship that God did not ordain. I've known them. They've known me. We've hung out together. They know all my secrets. And so what? You're out of position. You're corrupting your priesthood. You're going to an altar and you're speaking what is not of God because you have created intimacy from someone else's false altars that are attacking what God wants to do and birth through you. We have come so, so individualized in Christian, in Christianity, especially Western Christianity, where we really think God is all about us and he is. But as long as it relates to his eternal story, as long as it relates to his eternal plan, you matter to God in as much as you are under the submission of his eternal glory, because he is just as just as he is merciful. He's just as just as he is kind. He's just as just as he is sovereign, right? You have a choice to make. That's the beauty of the sovereignty of God. Are you going to get in position or are you going to get left? And this is the hard message we don't want to preach on pulpits because it is not a sexy Christianity. Jesus does love you as long as you are obedient to the will of the Father and you come under submission. But the love of Jesus can't save somebody who don't want to get saved. That's why people die and go to hell every day. He loved everybody in hell, but they still have. So still sold because he gives you a choice, right? And so your priesthood is required to be pure to maintain the altar that would fan the flame of sacrifice. Think it not strange that Abraham didn't even tell Sarah she was he was going to sacrifice Isaac. Because Sarah, after being jealous of Hagar, telling that man to go sleep with that lady and then kicking that lady out, feeling some type of way about Ishmael, 
she had a couple altars speaking. He's like, no, no, uh, Abraham, you're not taking my son, my only son. No, you're not going to kill him. Wisdom. Sarah had things she had clearly demonstrated through scripture that she was dealing with that were in direct contest, context. You know the word I'm trying to use. Contest, yeah, contestants to the desire of God to bring forth, thank you, Prophet Zen, to bring forth to Abraham. That's why the people that went up with Abraham were the people that went up with Abraham. And at a certain point, the servants had to get left too. It's just me and Isaac, Bruce, you stay here. We'll be back. Loyalty is the reason that you're at the place you're at unfulfilled in the promises of God. You're loyal to the wrong thing. And as a prophet, your loyalty to God will always be tested. Why is that? Because God does not play about his loyalty. It is not optional for you to remain loyal to the voice of God. Enemy wants you to believe that you can speak for God and speak for another deity. Well, I just want to love them to life. Is that how God said? And is that what God said? And let me tell you this. I know that sometimes we can, hmm, sometimes we will confuse the burden, right? Sometimes we will confuse the burden and be like, because it is a burden, it is not worthy of sacrifice. What was God's burden to Abraham? Your offspring. Sometimes because we have not fine tuned our ears or because we have associations with altars that are not speaking for the one true God. We will look at the sacrifice required and rebuke it because it looks like the burden that God gave us. And so maybe God gave you a burden for the LGBTQ plus community, but he sacrifices, you have to sacrifice feeling like their friend because you have to tell them the truth or they will not be saved. And you're like, well, God, you call me to love them. You give me such a burden for them. I've called you to sacrifice them because it's in stripping their carnality, their salvation can be guaranteed. You cannot confuse your bird. Well, listen, you cannot confuse the sacrifice and say, because it was a burden, it is not, it, it does not, um, it is not required for the sacrifice. Jesus was the burden of God, the father, but yet he was a sacrifice. That's the progression of a burden. At some point, that burden has to be held up to God and still de be demoted. Yes, God, you made my shoulders heavy with this weight of whatever this is. Marriage, families, wealth, prosperity, the Black, you know, whatever, reunification in America. Yes, you made my shoulders heavy with this burden, but I'll lay that even down for you, God, because at the end of the day, you're always testing. Is my allegiance to you? Is my allegiance to whatever you've given me? And a burden is still a gift from God. And so as a prophet, you'll get processed through Four altars. Let's go over them again. The altar of burden. The altar of recreation. The altar of friendship or allegiance, alliance. And lastly, the altar of sacrifice or the altar of the Lord's bitterness. Romans 8, 17 says, and then we'll end with this and we'll do the breakouts. <clears throat> it says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Sometimes we confuse the fact that God requires us to sacrifice the thing that he's given us because we don't see that at the end of that sacrifice, the glory that he intends to give us, right? There is no sacrifice in the kingdom without the reward of glory. And so if you lay that thing at the altar, the Lord has to give you more, better, Jesus sacrificed his life and he received the kingdoms of this earth, have now become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And he received the highest name that is above every single name. That is the lie of the enemy. The enemy says, if you give this thing to God, that you had the potential to make a God, whether it's your life or the things that he's giving you in this life, then there is not more for you at the end of it. But God says, no, if you give this thing to me, then I know that you don't love anything more than me and I can give you everything because at this point we are covenanted and there's nothing that will keep us apart. That's what God says. And that's why at the point of giving up Isaac, the Lord says, no, don't do it. I know that there is nothing you will not withhold from me, Abraham. Nothing. Nothing. You will receive this promise. It will be through your seed that I will bless all the nations of the earth. 
And ultimately, that's the test of all of us as we live in this life, right? It ha like, is it the marriage? You're going to get the marriage? What you thought was the perfect marriage, you're going to lay it on the altar? Sometimes you got to look messy. You got, sometimes you got to look disheveled, unkept, not cute for the Lord. And it's not going to make sense. Lord, you gave me this marriage. You gave me this spouse. You gave me this kids. Why am I sacrificing them to you? Why? 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 I, I thought I was being a good steward. And that's what, another lie. When God calls you to sacrifice something, here come the enemy. That's you not being a good steward of it. You're not being a good steward of it. Ain't that what happened every time the Lord told you to give a big offering? Well, I got to be a good steward of my finances. Is that being a good steward? Is that fear manifesting itself so you don't receive the inheritance that comes after the sacrifice? So discern, what is this? What are we undergoing right now? You don't want to sacrifice, but there's something that God has for you at the end side of that sacrifice. Nothing, including in the realm of, <laughs> nothing is free, y'all. Even salvation wasn't free. There was a price paid and it was, it bankrupt heaven. That's how expensive salvation is. You receive it freely, but somebody paid for it. God paid for it. Jesus paid ultimate price for it. And so the idea that we think that we can inherit glory on this side without the sacrifice of an altar makes zero sense because you don't see that principle upheld anywhere in scripture. It's nowhere. You cannot find any scripture where even David said, I will not give to the Lord what does not cost me anything. That is why he is the man after God's own heart. The murderer, the adulterer, because he understood the necessity of sacrifice. No, he didn't obey, but he said, okay, I know obedience is better than sacrifice, but I will sacrifice after I disobeyed. Because that's the price of disobedience, sacrifice. When you choose not to obey, now you got to sacrifice. Come on. If he didn't get, come on. Give it up early. Do it. Do it. I bet you if Abraham hadn't sacrificed Isaac, he would have lost that boy. The Lord knew. But once you give up that thing, even the principle of the tithe, and we're going to end here, and I'm so glad um, Prophet Zen touched on it earlier. A lot of people don't tithe. A lot of y'all don't tithe because you're like, oh, I got to give up this. But do you not know in Malachi, it says that once you give up the tithe, then the rest is blessed? Because the Lord knows that you won't even withhold that from him, which you consider your first. And so your, your tithing is not for the sake because God needs your money. God can print money. Don't worry about it. The miracles of money happen literally every day. That's not the reason you tithe. You tithe because you're saying, hey, this is an assurance that everything else that comes out of this is blessed. And that's why in Corinth, right, there was a man named Cornelius whose alms to the poor came up as a memorial to the Lord. Do you not know that your giving speaks for you? Your sacrificing speaks for you? Cornelius, even though salvation was not for the Gentiles, because he sacrificed, because he gave, he was able to finagle his way into a promise that was not even originally for him. Wasn't for him. But your prayer, your arms have come up as a memorial before the Lord. Sacrifice will take you places that are required for you. It's required in the kingdom and builds character. Your suffering is what teaches you obedience. Your sacrifice is part of your suffering. And if you partake in the suffering of Christ, you can then also are qualified to take in his glory. Amen. All right, y'all. I know that was a lot between Prophet Zen and I. Um, thank you for hanging on. Um, come on, Prophet Zen says, stop averting obedience. It's better than sacrifice because you want your sacrifice. Ooh, Jesus, because you want your sacrifice to be qualified. That's the two and the one. What I want to do, um, for those of you that have been on the chambers before, I want us to break up into um, groups. And actually, Prophet Zen, could you lead us in the, I know I ain't actually had a time. Could you lead us in the, um, what's the thing called? Activation? Yes. Baba, baba. Ooh, how you want to get activated in this joint, y'all? So, okay, y'all know um, I'm a seer prophet, so I be seeing, I be seeing, I be smelling. So, for all of us that have different type of giftings, some of you may be seers, right? What do I mean by seers? Your dominant area is sight. So, you may be one that sees things through 
visions, moving visions, moving pictures. You may also get impressions. You may also get a thought, a, a thing that comes in like, oh, this is it. If that is how you operate, begin to prophesy that way. You may begin to smell something. That is a word of knowledge. That is a word of wisdom. I'm going to show you in a few minutes of how all this is going to go. I just got to break up the senses. You may hear audible or inaudible, which is in your inner witness, right? That inner man. And then you may be able to taste something. You may be able to smell something. And then there are those who are ones you feel. You are discerning of the spirits. You are discerner or you, are, you're, you can dwell in your emotions and say, okay, this is what I feel like God is saying, right? Or anything else. So you can begin in that type of dimension. And how do you do that? Start by going small. Like if you've never done it before, just ask the Lord, give you something that is small for you. You can say, Lord, give me a color for that.